Okay, perfect, perfect. So I great, uh, I take great pleasure in welcoming Sir Anand Ranganathan to our midst today in our uh, webinar series of distinguished lectures. And uh, as you know, dear fellows, this lecture series was to try to uh, reconceptualize or imagine or envisage a post-COVID world. And I can't really think of anyone better than uh, Professor Ranganathan to take us through because not only is he a very eminent uh, scientist, a biochemist, uh, he's a professor of molecular medicine. Uh, he is a front-line uh, uh, researcher in malaria. He's done some pioneering work in uh, preventing the cells from capturing malaria. But in addition to all of this, he's a great humanist. He's a commentator on uh, almost everything under the sun. I'm sure all of you have seen him practically every day on Times Now. And I had sent our academic research uh, source officer some of his doodles, and uh, I hope she can show them to you. I've sent her a doodle on, on Arnab, which was done way back when, uh, when he was a consulting editor with News Laundry. Now he's a consulting editor with Saraja magazine. But if you see that doodle, he, and he's done several, some he's done on menu cards, you know, you can see the range of his genius. You know, that he's a genius is not in doubt, but simply the range of his genius will be, uh, you know, evident if you, if you look at that uh, uh, doodle, which I, which I hope Ritikaji can, can show us. The, many of you probably don't know this, but he's also the author of three novels. Uh, the Land of the Wilted Rose, published by Rupa uh, in 12, uh, 2012. Then Love and Honor, Bloomsbury, whom he has pitched. I'll come to that in a moment. And uh, more, more recently, The Rat Eater, again with Bloomsbury. Uh, uh, you know, who uh, is also, you know, a great journalist, the one who, who actually... Uh, Sorry, on uh, on uh, Beaufort's many many years ago. Uh, a scroll kije niche, please, so that we can see the doodle. You know, this is a fantastic satire that he wrote in 2013. Uh, you know, before I got to know him actually, so I was really wondering who is this guy? And uh, just just scroll down a little bit if you don't mind. Uh, uh, ji. Uh, or niche dekhe ek, ek inka diagram ye sketch aayegi main sketch dikhana chahta hu people may take some time and read it ah there you are there you are now you just look at this isko thoda sa aap expand kar sakte hain iski size bada sakte hain ye dekhiye this is before i started republic so it's called arnab tv and uh, you can see uh, are acha ha kahan gaya and he's got a sikka you know a government of india coin with arnab so you can see Predicted his excessive narcissism way back seven years ago, and uh, uh, then he'll say, you know, uh, just look at tonight's pugilists. Aap dekh lijiye kya likha hai niche. And then he's got these things uh, boring uh, for, uh, uh, you know, I won't name the gentleman, but our former prime minister. Uh, uh, there is uh, our our dear friend uh, 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 here, Suhail. Uh, you can see him there. And then the truth quotient in all of these channels is very tiny. You can see there that black space. And uh, uh, you can look at the uh, crossword here. And I won't read you the names, but you can see the radial tapes unfolding there in the crossword. So you can, you can see Dr. Ranganathan's, uh, uh, you know, range and, and uh, uh, satirical genius there at work. एक मेन्यू कार्ड वाला अगर होगा दूसरा देख लीजिए अगर भेजा तो वो बहुत बढ़िया है यू नो ही हैज अ वेरी वेरी डिस्टिंग्विश्ड एकेडमिक करियर ही वाज अ अ नेहरू फेलो अ सेंटेनरी आई थिंक अ सेंटेनरी नेहरू फेलो एट कैम्ब्रिज एट पेम्ब्रुक एट पेम्ब्रुक कॉलेज केम वेयर ही डिड हिज पोस्ट इन इन नेचुरल साइंसेस देन ही गॉट एमए एमएससी व्हिच इज of course but for 60 the for 16 years he was next door in ICGEB that is the National Center for 
electrical engineering and biotechnology. And then he joined uh, JNU in, in 2015, and he became a full professor last year. He's a dedicated scientist. He publishes in the top journals regularly. And uh, I, I must say that more recently, he became a hero on Twitter for standing up you know, to his rights. And we all supported him. And after, I think, 10 days of being banned on Twitter, I believe they apologized to him, you know? So this is unprecedented. He has millions of followers on Twitter. And uh, he's, I guess, uh, a very well-known uh, personality today, a television personality in India, and always sensible, fact-based analysis. And I must tell you, he's also uh, a great Ambedkarite, okay? So I'm sure Dr. Chahal will ask him a question about uh, how Ambed Dr. Ambedkar should be the father of the nation and not Mahatma Gandhi, uh, among other questions. But I just wanted to say two words, uh, if you don't mind, Anand. I Please. wanted to say two words just by way of introducing our topic, you know, which is really about pandemics, you know? And I, I loved your title. So the abstract doesn't tell anything. It reveals nothing. So we'll wait for your lecture. The, the title is to change or not to change the post-COVID-19 world. So this is the title. But uh, I was reading you know, a few months ago this, this uh, book by Frank M. Snowden. This is not Edward Snowden, OK, the guy who has been in exile in Russia for uh, speaking up and uh, you know, leaking out uh, you know, like, like uh, Assange. Uh, very sensitive documents. But this is a historian of the sciences. His name is Frank Snowden. He, Frank M. Snowden, he teaches at Yale. And he's got a fascinating book called Epidemics in Society, which started out as a book, uh, sorry, started out uh, as a course at, at Yale University. And, uh, you know, it's almost prophetic. The book came out in 2019, before the COVID pandemic. And he, he tells you, about how pandemics have affected the world, have, have changed society. And uh, I was reading through this book, and it seemed to me uh, um, that, you know, there are two almost contrary ways, you know, in which uh, pandemics uh, have changed human society. One is that they have radically altered society more or as much as wars famines, invasions, and colonialism. If you look at the history of uh, human society, uh, you know, pandemics have affected social structures, they've affected the design of cities, they've affected public health. And, uh, you know, all these measures that we take today for granted, quarantine and so forth, uh, they, they were actually an outcome of the pandemics. If you just see the Black Plague, from roughly 500 AD to the 1950s, the Black Plague affected us, you know. There was the Spanish flu a little earlier, the White Plague, which was, of course, tuberculosis, which was the most romantic disease of the 19th century. You know, Emily Bronte died of it, as did Keats. Uh, and then, of course, later, smallpox, and more recently, HIV, AIDS, Ebola. So, in, in other words, uh, you know, pandemics have been very much a part of human society since ever since we can remember. And uh, when we when we look at some of the case fatality ratios or rates uh, for something like the Black Plague, they could be as high as fifty percent. You know, and we've forgotten all that. But that bubonic plague uh, in our grandparents' time, you know, they affected you know big cities in India like Bombay and Calcutta. And they actually came out of China and Hong Kong. But uh, many, many great books have been set on the background of the plague, Journey of the Plague Year, Albert Camus' Plague. And the earlier book is, of course, by Daniel Defoe, The Decameron of uh, Boccaccio. And I was just remembering, Anand, this morning, Romeo and Juliet, you know, actually the, uh, the entire climax and misunderstanding when Juliet's letter doesn't reach uh, Romeo, who's exiled to uh, to Mantua. I mean, he's he's been sent out of Verona, uh, and uh, it's all because of a quarantine. You know, the people who are supposed to send Juliet's letter have been 
uh, forced to stay at home. So the letter doesn't reach, and in the end, everybody kills themselves, you know. So I, I think, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, that, uh, so that's one side, that pandemics have, uh, have really influenced uh, human society in, uh, in a myriad ways more, uh, or as much as wars and invasions and famines and, and other cataclysmic events. So that's one view. The other view is somehow human memory is so short that we never seem to really learn and change our lifestyles. And uh, once we've got a vaccine or once a pandemic seems to be in control, we just go back to our ways. And especially in today's world where most of our uh, deadly viruses are zoonotic, they, they, they jump species, right? They jump from... I'll tell you, Anand, we have these humongous bats in IIAS, you know? They are massive, and I sometimes worry about what kinds of viruses they are carrying. And uh, anyhow, so, you know, the, the more we travel, the more we change. They are, they are flying forces. Uh, so, uh, sorry, sorry, Professor Raju, you were saying something? Oh, we lost you. We'll come back to you. But, uh, but I'm saying that uh, uh, human beings and, and animals are, are in such proximity, and uh, these viruses jump. Uh, their natural habitats of some of these animals are being destroyed. Uh, and... Uh, Way we travel is that a virus can spread in 24 hours. You know, you may be in Shanghai today, and uh, tomorrow morning you can be in in uh, in New York, uh, and uh, uh, you know, or you may be in Delhi today, and tomorrow you might be in Melbourne. So within 24 hours, you can spread something. Uh, so it really makes us think deeply, and I think this is what Professor Ranganathan is going to take us through. Uh, that is it going to be the more things change, the more they remain the same. That is, the, the moment you get a vaccine, you're going to be, you know, careless again and not change our patterns of consumption, our social structure, uh, the way we've designed our healthcare delivery. I mean, how to treat our migrant laborers, you know, all these issues. Are we just going to go back to being the way we were? Uh, or are we going to radically change? I think this is the question that, uh, that Snowden also raises. And, uh, you know, one of the last things I want to say, the pa tremendous paradox of the pandemic, just this morning you must have read that our GDP has shrunk some 23%. And all over the world there are job losses, there's a threat of recession, but the rich have got tremendously richer. You know, for example, Bezos has got much richer. He's a centi-trillionaire or whatever that word is. I don't even know the word. Uh, Elon Musk, all these guys become much richer uh, during the pandemic, you know, when economies are contracting and uh, people are losing jobs and the welfare systems all over the world are under tremendous stress. So I think it's this kind of scenario through which uh, I suppose Professor Anand will lead us. And I just wanted to say, Anand, one last thing that we're going to get locked out after 50 minutes. Yeah. It's our paid subscription somehow hasn't kicked in, so my apologies in advance. But you must have got three links, so we'll be eagerly waiting for you to log right back in uh, uh, after the first 50 minutes. And, uh, take as long as you like. 40 minutes is ideal, but 10 minutes here or there, no problem at all. Right. All yours, Anand. I'm going to mute the mic now. Right. Thank you for joining us once again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Makarand. It's a real pleasure and an honor, and uh, <clears throat> more so because you are a JNU colleague, and JNU misses you. <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I'm not very sure if the people who are still doing dharna or plan to do dharna outside your office miss you or not. But uh, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure knowing you over the past four or five years, and um, it's, it's, it's really uh, fantastic to see how IIAS is, is doing so well. Uh, and you have uh, played a, a marvelous role in that. So thank you very much uh, once again. Uh, coming to the lecture, uh, in fact, before I do, uh, just uh, to uh, take a few points out of your marvelous introduction, um, I think before, because I'm not taking any notes, but I think I remembered you talking about um, viruses and how interlinked uh, viruses are with humans. Incidentally, 10% of our human genome is actually viral DNA. 
which is really significant. So we have been living with viruses and bacteria. In fact, we can't survive without viruses and bacteria. There are more, uh, there are about 110 trillion bacteria on us uh, than there are human cells. So bugs complete us. Uh, and the second point you, you mentioned, I think I've forgotten, but I'll, I'll probably remember it, uh, you know, when I'm uh, giving my talk. So to come back to this uh, topic that I chose uh, to change or not to change, I, I found it quite fascinating over the past five months as to um, the choices that we have uh, ever since the lockdown happened. And it doesn't seem to be going away in the sense, of course, there are lockdown extensions, but there are also, um, uh, uh, you know, things are opening up slowly. Uh, but this, the specter of uh, Corona coming back again, second wave, third wave, it hasn't really left us. India, the cases are increasing. Um, uh, I think it was 70 to 80,000 uh, cases every day now. Uh, so we've, we've caught this thing late. Uh, but the fact is, um, as Makaran uh, so put it so succinctly in his introduction, uh, we humans always have a choice. Uh, do we want to change uh, when we are faced with a calamity or should we not change? So I, I would begin by saying that from what we've read always in our school textbooks that man is a social animal. I think we have to live with the fact that now man is a socially distant animal. And I think uh, that, that is something that we uh, possibly, uh, not only do we have to accept, I, I think in a large, large measure we have accepted. But as far as changing is concerned, it is always a choice given to us. We can, we can completely ignore, we can completely ignore this virus in the sense we can, uh, we can go back to exactly how we were living our lives, uh, you know, not socially distant, not wearing masks, not using sanitizers and then see where it goes because uh, in effect of course uh, covid as a as a virus uh, this covid-19 virus is more serious than a lot of other viruses but that is not to say that uh, viral infections are not a daily part of our lives in fact uh, they happen every year and um, they there is something called the flu season uh, of course covid is much serious as i said but even before the severity was known the data uh, of flu seasons was known. So, for example, in America, every year, approximately 60 to 65,000 people die in the flu season. But nobody, the economy doesn't shut down. In, in Italy, for example, in 2017, uh, 24,000 people died in the flu season. Uh, right now, the COVID uh, number of deaths in Italy is 32,000. So, yes, it is more serious. I'm not denying that. But the fact is that people uh, are always making choices. Um, uh, the, the thing with COVID is that uh, the choices that you make are sometimes thrust upon you. Um, and you don't have any choice in the sense that you don't have a choice in dictating to the government that your, uh, uh, you know, the economy should completely open up or the, the health concerns that you had uh, or the lack thereof, uh, uh, you know, should be taken into account. So uh, this is, I would say, one aspect where a lot of things went out of our control. But of course, in a democracy, everyone has a voice. And uh, uh, the more people talk about one issue, the more they take it up. Uh, that obviously gets amplified. And that is how the governments act on it. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they accept. Uh, and then they act on it. They formulate their policy. So. I've broadly divided my talk into four issues that I feel uh, that I think we should change. I'm, I'm for change. I think this calamity that has been brought upon us is, is I would say, quote unquote, a blessing in disguise because uh, it, it will allow us to change for the better. So the four things are, I'll briefly touch upon them. Uh, the first that immediately comes to mind to change or not to change would be in the areas of trade, uh, economy, globalization, um, our own uh, economic edifice, uh, our, own, our own financial uh, distribution, and of course, China, our engagement with China. The second issue that I think, uh, 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 you know, uh, merits a little bit of uh, going into would be education in the domain of education, uh, university education, uh, foreign universities, 
The third, of course, that has deeply impacted us in the last six months of the lockdown and will continue to do so would be in the field of arts and cinema. And the fourth uh, would be in the field of science. And I would like to uh, go into a little bit of detail about uh, how we should, not how we can, how we should change in these domains and how our mistakes, we are actually paying for our mistakes of the past that we did not change. So that would be in the field of science. But so let, let me begin by uh, the first issue that I would like to talk about, which would be the trade economy, globalization, China, and uh, uh, our own economic structure. So I think um, I have been saying it since 2015 that uh, democracies should only trade with democracies. And that is the only way to force dictatorships to turn into democracies. Uh, and of course, uh, the world uh, absolutely did not take notice to this. And that is the reason why we have, uh, uh, you know, suddenly we have, or in the last 10, 15 years, this behemoth called China, which is a dictatorship. And why do I say it is pertinent right now is because there is ample documented evidence that China hid the severity of COVID from the world. There are about 20, 25 points uh, that are documented, that are factual, that tell you that uh, China hid from the world the severity of the COVID, how, when it should have locked itself down, when it should have declared that yes, this is something which is going to uh, uh, almost destroy the world as we know it. Uh, it should have acted uh, along those lines. It absolutely did not. The, uh, the most, uh, uh, I think, apparent uh, evidence is in, in the domain of travel, travel and industry. So China, there is evidence that China shut the air travel uh, within China but allowed the air travel to carry on, uh, 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 you know, unimpeded around the world. Uh, so I think at a time when uh, Wuhan was shut down or was going to be shut down or a lot of other cities, uh, there are about seven to 11 million people who were traveling in uh, China to China and from China to the rest of the world. And the tragedy of this is of course that the virus spread this is not to say that the virus would not have spread. I mean, viruses are meant to spread, but the speed with which it spread, the devastation that it caused initially in Europe, in America, and now in Asia, uh, could have been stopped, or at least the world would have had much more sympathy with this dictatorship called China. The tragedy, of course, is that the WHO uh, acted little more than a stooge of China, which is a real tragedy because here is here was one world world organization that should have actually stepped up and like it did. In fact, Samir Saran of ORS wrote a very nice paper comparing the uh, the actions of WHO in light of SARS-1 epidemic that happened in 2003 compared to SARS-2 epidemic that is uh, uh, the current epidemic. So um, in the last 20 years, we've been feeding this dragon. The dragon has gotten fatter and fatter and fatter. The dragon uh, has completely uh, ignored all the democratic traditions with which the world should work, the world economy should transact. Uh, it, it, is, it is a dictatorship, not only uh, in the fact that it actually stifles freedom of speech and expression and tramples upon the human rights of its own citizens. As we know, the Uyghur Muslims, the fate of Uyghur Muslims right now, which uh, a lot of people in India, especially the communists who love China, are completely silent on that 1 million Uyghur Muslims are right now interned in concentration camps in China. Um, so uh, it has not only trampled upon the human and civil rights of its own citizens, but also by having uh, economic and financial malpractices, by propping up through unfair means, through uh, industrial espionage, uh, uh, through unfair trade practices. It has completely skewed trade in its favor over the last 20 years, and we've allowed We've allowed China to do this. But right now, it was just a matter of a month where it could have acted, but it didn't. And that shows that when there are nations that are not democracies they, and you keep feeding them, the devastations they can cause. So uh, right now, I think uh, the world in very large measure has also realized that um, uh, this cannot go on. I'm not saying that people would cut off 
uh, all trade with China, but certainly in the uh, what we had completely ignored uh, till now, people have started seriously thinking about it. Um, in fact, there was a paper, uh, I think a week or two weeks ago, which actually noted down, uh, which uh, kind of divided the kind of uh, goods that we, that we in, Indians trade with China. And it turned out that we can actually source uh, from countries other than China, about 80 to 87% of the goods that we import from China. So uh, the fact that we've started thinking along those lines, the fact that uh, if not in so many words, this government is also thinking along those lines, of course, when it talks of Atmanir Bharta, um, in one sense, you can say that, yes, it wants to decouple our huge trade imbalance, in fact, our complete trading with China. But of course, we can't do that right now because everything from mobile phones to the ingredients of the mobile phones to toys and everything is actually imported from China. There's about 50, 60 billion trade imbalance. We can't do that if we decide with the click of our fingers. But the fact that we've started thinking about it, tells us that the nations are concerned, the world is concerned with what China did as far as COVID was concerned. The other aspect that is also very important when we think of this change, which is what uh, 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 you know, the proposal was, that to, to trade only with democracies, because what that would do is, in the long term, uh, that, would, uh, that would empowerish dictatorships and that would allow uh, the people or the civil movements inside those dictatorships to rise up and, uh, uh, you know, teach their own governments a lesson. Um, and then perhaps their own dictatorships can move towards democracies or some semblances of democracy. I'm not saying that this is a perfect world and this is a, a linear uh, sequence of events that is going to happen. Of course, uh, the world doesn't turn out like that. We've, we've already seen what happened when you had the spring revolutions uh, in, in the Arab world and how, how uh, terrible it has turned out to be. That is not to say that there were so many other factors that were involved and it was not as cut out as trading with democracies once you make a dictatorship a democracy. But the fact that I think we should also learn to remember is, is to not forsake globalization in our, um, in our wish to decouple from China. We should not forget that the, the single uh, the single uh, policy uh, that has uh, uh, that has removed poverty, maximum uh, amount of poverty from this world is actually globalization. And why I say this is important is that many people confuse the message of the prime minister when he talked about Atmanir Bharta, that it is, oh, it is going back to the license Raj system, or we are going back to uh, manufacturing ambassadors and you know, high, high import duties and tariffs and tax regime and all that stuff. Uh, I don't know, uh, the government hasn't come out uh, with a clear cut vision as to whether little amount of that would also uh, be incurred when you talk of Atmanir Bharta. But the fact remains is that India is, is truly uh, uh, a very important cog in this globalized world. We have, uh, we have not only accepted uh, our place in this globalized world, we have not only traded with, uh, uh, you know, more than 150, 160 nations, we have also encouraged this over the last 15, 20 years, ever since, in fact, the economy opened up in 1990s. And this government has as well. So I think, and, and if you were to look at the philosophical moorings of this, I think you don't, uh, you know, just one phrase is enough, which is what traditionally our civilization has given to the world, which is astonishingly scientific in its scope and acuity, which is Vasudeva um, Kutumbaka. Now, many people scoff at that whenever I mention this, and they say, oh, no, you know, we've, um, this is what, um, uh, I, I don't know, there is a Panchatantra or Jataka tale that says that, uh, uh, you know, that talked about uh, Vasudeva Kutumbakam and how the wolf ate up uh, the sheep it was, I can't really remember. But uh, the fact of the matter is that, uh, uh, you know, liking the phrase or, uh, uh, you know, accepting that, yes, it is scientific truth, Vasudeva Kutumbaka, and also the fact that it is a maxim from the Maha Upanishad, in fact, chapter 6, verse 72, and the fact that it is also inscribed at the entrance to our central hall of our parliament house, um, is that uh, there, is, there is nothing wrong in accepting that, yes, indeed, the world is a family and the world will become more prosperous the moment we think of the world as a family, the moment we move away from 
tribalism, some may call it nationalism, uh, but of course that's another uh, topic altogether. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that this whole concept, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, you know, it may have emanated from the churnings of non-scientific philosophies, but modern genetics has shown how exceptionally liberal, progressive, and scientific it is. You know, because at the heart of evolution lies the axiom, the survival of any species. And it is dependent on enabling genetic diversity within it. The more mutations our genes accumulate during the passage of evolutionary time, the more chance we have of combating a stress that may come along in the form of a disease, an epidemic, or as a threat to our survival itself. Because survival of the fittest is impossible without survival of the fraternity. Mix, mate, make the cut. And the scientist William Stemmer demonstrated this brilliantly in perhaps the single most important, both scientifically and philosophically, biology experiment since the Miller and the Watson Crick DNA double helix milestones. His so-called sexual PCR method rapidly introduced mutations within a gene following each cycle of mother to daughter copying, with the result that the cell containing the present generation progeny was able to withstand the kind of stress, stress hitherto considered insurmountable. So here at last, long last, was an irrefutable demonstration of Darwin's theory of evolution. That whole genome sequencing, the discovery of the ribozyme, and the protocell model had only but end tours. So in a matter of hours through what Stemmer did, a mother gene that had taken millions of years of slow and steady evolution to become worthy of combating stress was shuffled together and mutated into a daughter gene that could now survive tens of thousands of times that very stress. So what enabled this directed, so-called directed evolution? The brute force of simple logic. Mix, mate, make the cut. And in a sense, this is what Vasudeva Kutumbakam is. A globalized world where people mix freely, they mate, exchange not only goods and ideas, but also genes, and they make the cut. Prosper, they are happy, they are healthy. Yes, of course, we are all Parsis in a way, some more, some less, and some actually. But the Parsis cannot survive for long. They will go extinct if they do not allow mixing of their genes with non parse You only have to ask the Habsburgs. Endogamy is the antithesis of evolution. And remarkably, our ancestors knew this as far back as 34,000 years ago. The passage of evolutionary time cannot be paused or reversed. It is a case of the wall sliding up to find the back. Why do we insist then that we know better? Why do we insist that we should not go for globalization? We should be Atmanirbhar in the sense or maybe misunderstand what Atmanirbharta means. And let, let me tell you the reason why we believe that India has been following this policy, especially Prime Minister Modi uh, of Vasudeva Kutumbha. India is a vital cog in the global trade. We are a vibrant democracy and have friendly relations with most countries of the world. In fact, we trade goods worth $620 billion with 194 nations. We rank impressively on the overall trade restrictiveness index. We welcome all with open arms are ranked 34th most friendly country. Our refugee policy, says the UNHCR chief, is an example for the world to follow. We have committed ourselves to the Paris climate deal, even though it would mean sacrificing on the speed of growth that all rich countries before us shied away from. We gave asylum to the Dalai Lama when most other countries would have been reluctant to for fear of antagonizing China because it was the right thing to do. We cut off all relations with apartheid South Africa to our enormous economic detriment, even as the Britons and the Americans, the so-called guardians of human rights, never did, because it was the right thing to do. All these are not traits displayed by a nation that believes that, uh, uh, you know, that does not believe in Vasudeva Kutum. So that is one point that I wanted to make, and I, I, I suppose I have I've dealt enough on this, that in order to, you know, spread wealth around in order to make the world more healthy, uh, more wealthy. Yes, we need to rethink and decouple from China, but that shouldn't be uh, our own undoing and lead to us decoupling from the rest of the world. So globalization should be here to stay, except that we have to rethink our own uh, uh, you know, issues with China. 
The other thing that I think uh, this pandemic has allowed us to do is, especially as Makaran mentioned, the, the GDP uh, year on year, I think it was quarter on quarter, is 20, down 23%. Uh, that was to be expected. There has been some uh, fake news floating around in the media that is one of the worst dips. It isn't. In America, it's about 33 to 37%. Japan is 29%. So India is, is faring as bad as a lot of other nations that have been made to suffer because of China. Incidentally, China, it is plus 3.3%. 3, 3 so that itself tells you the whole story. But uh, now that we've we've actually uh, down to uh, scraping the bottom of the barrel, if I may use that expression, as far as finance and economy is concerned, uh, we, we have a choice. We can either change ourselves or just wait out what is going to happen to us. And I think, I think we should prefer the former because I think this is the time that we need to make structural changes. And one of the most profound structural changes that in fact, Prime Minister Modi talked about uh, in 2013 or in the run up to uh, the general election of 2014 uh, was that a government has no business to be in business. That was, that was one phrase that, um, that was loved by almost, uh, you know, all those people who, who believe in logic and common sense. And um, unfortunately, in the last six years, all what this government has done is to be in the business of running businesses. So I think if there is one thing that I would like to see us change uh, after this pandemic, after the devastation that it has caused to our um, economy and our finance, is to actually herald a new age in privatization. Did you know, for example, that we have 1,825 public sector units? Quarter of them are non-functional, but we are still paying for a fifth of our annual budgetary allocation of 27 lakh crores, a fifth of it, 20-21%, goes up in propping up public sector units. States have a liability of 50 lakh crores in the last decade. PSU banks have NPAs which are totaling more than 10 lakh crores. Why do we keep on doing this? And as for disinvestment, so there has been not a single privatization in the last six, seven years. As for disinvestment, the PSU, for example, PFC, we are uh, taking the junked family silver from one pocket and putting it in the other pocket. So when we talk of disinvestment into a PSU, it is being disinvested in, but what or which entity is investing in it is actually a public sector entity. For example, uh, PFC has bought into another PSU REC, just like LIC bought into Coal India. Likewise, NTPC is buying PHDC, PSU, and NEEPCO. In fact, center is carving New Maligar 19,000 crore revenue from BPCL before selling the latter. Uh, so I think the government has no business to be in business is the first mantra that this government should really go for after uh, you know the, the pandemic is a little bit under control and we, we recover or start to lead our lives again. The other things about uh, economy that the government hasn't really acted on is land acquisition, labor reforms. There have been some progress there, but the Indian labor is too costly, even if you compare it to ASEAN countries, for example. But one other aspect is, incidentally, when Makaran was talking about how all the sectors across our e economic um, outlook have dipped dangerously, but there is one sector that has increased, which is agriculture, and which is uh, logical because people have been eating and consuming agricultural goods over the last six months during the lockdown as well. I mean, you can't not do that. But you look at the flexibility of our economy, it is not flexible at all. For example, agriculture contributes only 14%. In fact, it's even less now. It's about 12.3% to our GDP. And yet 82% of all Indian households, 82%, are dependent on it. 44% of our 475 million strong labor force is involved in agriculture, 44%. In developed countries, it is two to 3%. 48% of farmers recently surveyed don't want the next generation to take up agriculture. Three lakh Indian farmers have committed suicide in the last 17 years. 95 million farmer households are not insured. Compensations, compensations cost twice 
as much as crop premiums. How many farmers committed suicide who already had insurance? We don't know this data, but I suspect, uh, uh, you know, very few. Now let us look at how we can change our agricultural practices. And I'll give you just one example of the disaster that our continued uh, reliance on age-old agricultural practices is costing us. Sugarcane, for example. Sugarcane takes up only 9% of the total cultivated area, but 72% of its irrigation water. 9% of cultivated area, but 72% of its irrigation water. Indian sugarcane production in 2018, I think it's the world's second largest, 350 billion kg sugarcane. The water requirement, 3,000 liter per kg. The total water used, 1 quadrillion liters. 1 quadrillion liters. Forget about billion, trillion. This is 1 quadrillion. And it is equivalent to 100 Gobind Sagar, world, uh, Gobind Sagar. And do you know what has happened? In the last five years, the sugar prices have halved. So when we continue to, you know, uh, keep to these age-old practices, when 44% of our labor force is involved in these, uh, uh, you know, archaic agricultural practices, um, this will inevitably lead to disaster. And one of the disasters that is a spin-off from this is actually water. Now, let me just give you other another startling statistics. The water availability per capita in 1991, it was 2,400 cubic meters. In 2011, it is 1,500 cubic meters. In 2017, it was 1,200 cubic meters. In 25 years, our per capita water availability is down to half. More than 65% of our rainwater, 65%, flows out into the sea. The Supreme Court has ordered that river linking should be expedited. In fact, Prime Minister Modi had said this in 2014 as well. But are we going on this? You know. So I, I think I've spoken enough on the economy. Let me very quickly come to uh, the other uh, aspects of this talk. The second one was education and university. Now, this is something that has affected us all in the last six months. We know it. I have, uh, for all those who have uh, children and their families, uh, it has been real hell, but now the schools have reopened uh, online. And I, I think I have to say this, if you remember in the 80s, uh, or, or the children who grew up, or people who grew up in the 80s used to always think uh, how hard it was to get a phone connection. In fact, you had to have a lot of political connections in order to get a phone connection, phone line connection. And, uh, uh, you know, not even 1% or maybe a fraction of that of Indians had phone, phone lines. So we used to think, how on earth are we going to ever compete? But then came technology, which was mobile, that allowed us to leapfrog. And right now, India has the teledensity is one of the highest in the world. So through leapfrogging, we can actually forsake a lot of um, uh, issues that totally become redundant. For example, now nobody even talks about a landline. In fact, we had a landline, we discontinued it because it's not important anymore. This is how technology allows us to leapfrog. And I think this one change that is going to happen through this, whatever we've learned in the last six months, is going to be the leapfrogging, complete leapfrogging of the way we educate our children, our students. And I think online is the is is the is the way to go. In another 15, 20 years, this is going to be absolute norm. We have to streamline. But as education is concerned, um, uh, we are going to see a complete leapfrogging of the way we educate. Of course, personally, um, uh, I foresee uh, universities would be redundant. So all those uh, who always wanted. Uh, JNU to not exist would be celebrating now. But uh, I'm not saying that the universities won't exist. Uh, what I'm saying is that um, I think they would be made quite redundant. Uh, we can hear you, Anand. We can uh, hear you. Right, right, right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, how much time do, have I got left? Because I, I do want to uh, uh, 
uh, emphasize uh, mostly on maybe 10, 10, 15 minutes, Makaran? Sure, absolutely sure. Carry on as long as you like. No problems. Right. Okay. Right. Um, so I think the way we teach uh, has to change. In fact, I was uh, it was very awkward uh, this last semester, uh, uh, my teaching online, taking exams. But I think um, if we streamline it, uh, this is this is going to change. This is going to bring a revolution, especially because the ease with which students, not only students who've taken, who have taken who have taken the course, but also people who are interested in listening and learning and who cannot afford, are not allowed to go and enter universities, can also partake in the same education. And of course, people have been talking about e-learning for the last 10, 15 years. This is the thrust. This is what was needed. This is why I say, quote unquote, blessing in disguise, that I think as far as education is concerned, um, uh, this is going the, the leap that is going to happen is going to be unprecedented because had this, uh, if this does not happen, we are actually we have been looking at this. Uh, uh, you know, this would is run to pass out from the, the school, as a chemist would say. The rate determining step is what dictates how a reaction proceeds. So the rate determining step is we have 15, 16 million, possibly more 12th class uh, uh, students who pass out from the 12th class and maybe only 800 universities out of that. God knows how many are good, decent universities. Uh, so this was a system that could not sustain itself. And now the chance has come for us to make brilliant online presentations, teaching, curricula, but everything has to be done. You have to spend a lot of money on it. We cannot do it. Uh, uh, you know, in a uh, very ramshackle, uh, ham-handed fashion, we, we, we must not do that. This has to be, a lot of money has to be spent on this. The government must realize that this is something uh, that, uh, that it has to uh, actually give preference to and priority to uh, in, in the coming three or four years. Because let me tell you, one of the, uh, the most sought after ministries um, in, uh, uh, you know, in any government uh, our finance, defense, and uh, you know many others. Home, for example, but uh, HRD, MHRD, science and technology. In fact, science and technology is not even a, of a cabinet rank; it's of a state rank. This is the kind of priorities that we've been giving it. But the fact remains that in a university, you may love to go and hear a wonderful speaker, but that's it. The next time you want to hear him, you have to attend the lecture again, maybe next year. But a great lecture once recorded and put on a link uh, that other millions can hear is there forever. And that is why now, you know, Richard Feynman, people are still flocking to YouTube and listening to his lectures. And I can tell you there are so many others who like wonderful lecturers and uh, at least in the remains of science, I can tell you Zostak comes to mind, a Nobel laureate who talked, who got a Nobel Prize on telomerase, but who has made uh, phenomenal contributions in, in the field of uh, uh, you know, protocells and how life evolved on Earth. So his lectures are there for millions to see and be inspired from. And likewise, so this is something that uh, now is the time for us to spend. Uh, and I, I, I would say millions wouldn't do. We have to spend a huge chunk of our budget on to getting leapfrogging this technology, which would, should be included in the education budget. And this, I know education is a concurrent subject that states have a huge role to play in it. Uh, uh, possibly the center uh, for that reason takes it as an excuse that uh, uh, you know we don't want to spend too much time and effort on it because the states can overrule us on many, which is fair enough. But uh, it, I, I, think, I think if a job is well done at the center level, then the states will follow suit. And this is something that, that we have to do. Uh, coming back very quickly, maybe just touching it very briefly uh, because I want to delve more on the uh, in the field of science is uh, before I do that is arts and cinema. Now, of course, this is something that this pandemic has devastated. The, the consequences are devastating uh, in, in terms of arts. Of course, if you want to include sports, yes, sports as well, but especially the arts, because um, if there is one thing that requires humans to interact and be inspired by, uh, it is the domain of the arts. You know, you go to a musical concert, people haven't been to a musical concert for six months. Um, 
So millions have lost their jobs because of because of that organization at the organizational level, at the artist's level. Um, nobody has been able to go and watch a film uh, for the last six months. So, uh, you know, the devast economic devastation is absolutely massive in these two domains. Uh, how do we come out of it? I, there is no answer to this. Unlike the other two where I've been suggesting solutions in this case, because because it is uh, by definition, this domain uh, hinges and uh, is based on human interaction. Um, you would have to go back to interacting with humans uh, if you want these domains to prosper. Having said that, the medium may change. For example, if there is one growth uh, that we have seen the last six months, it is on this OTT uh, platforms uh, that are able to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you're able to watch films, you're able to watch whatever you had to go to cinema halls earlier, you can watch it uh, you know, from the comfort of your home. Uh, you beam it live sometimes or it is recorded. So Netflix, Amazon, in fact, one of the reasons why uh, Jeff Be Bezos uh, is now the world's richest man by um, 100, million, 100 billion, in fact, he's, his worth is now 200 billion is because Amazon has done spectacularly well. Its shares have risen so much, of course, it's notional uh, to some extent. Um, its shares have risen because people uh, have been ordering stuff they needed to and not only that you had the OTT Amazon Prime platform is it and you know so so uh, 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 you know any devastation also leads a, a road out and I think this is this is one aspect especially in the domain of uh, domain of films and world cinema and and movies uh, that uh, that will really prosper uh, but having said that uh, uh, you know you, you can have a platform i.e. a cinema hall at home but you have to watch the movie and the movie has to be created uh, you know outdoors with humans interacting so it is again limited so all uh, all what ott has done is 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 provided you with a mechanism where you don't have to go to a cinema hall anymore uh, but of course the content has to be created and for the last 6 months uh, the content uh, nobody has been able to create that content so again you may have an ott platform yes you, may, you know it may make uh, jeff bezos the uh, world's richest man by hundred billion dollars. But at the end of the day, you're only as good a platform as the content that you are, uh, uh, you know, streaming on it. Uh, so I think that again is a redetermining step. Um, so I'm not very sure that humans would be able to change or they need to change post this COVID epidemic in the fields of arts and cinema. In fact, they must revert to um, living with the virus and continuing with uh, making movies and uh, music and arts and everything. Of course, it'll be very odd um, to have, uh, uh, you know, kissing, kissing scenes with the mask on. I don't know how they're going to do it. They're, they're possibly going to digitally erase the masks for those scenes. Uh, let me now finally come to the domain of science, because I think that that is one of the most important aspects where, um, yes, uh, again, I'm in, in this particular thing in two minds, whether we need to change or we, we would not change. Um, as far as theoretical sciences are concerned, you can, uh, uh, you know, th there, is, there, there is some merit in saying that, uh, you know, this COVID epidemic has not caused devastation on that, on that extent. But as far as wet science is concerned, biology, chemistry, experimental physics, uh, so many other streams of science that require bench work, that require a lab to run, uh, it has caused devastation. It, it certainly has. Uh, the labs have been shut mostly uh, around India and so many parts of the world. Now they're slowly opening up, but of course, uh, you, the, the scientific work, uh, the workforce was spread around. Uh, uh, they, they could not come to the labs, and now if the transportation isn't there, they still can't manage that. So this would this would again take at least better part of two months, three months for us to get back to running the labs with the same speed uh, and efficiency as what we were before the pandemic happened. The, the most important aspect is the lesson that we must learn from this epidemic as far as science is concerned, and we must change. And here is where I take you back to SARS 2003. Now, th this was pre-Twitter, pre-Facebook, but I still remember it because 2003 is only 17 years old, uh, ago. Of course, that is one generation, but I remember it. Uh, uh, we heard about it. 
um, but we did not pay much attention to. Of course, people who were traveling, businesses, they were affected severely. Uh, India wasn't that much affected because nobody was conducting these millions and millions of tests. Um, but the fact remains that a lot of people were worried about it, so much so that a lot of research that you you hearing now that people are conducting on SARS-2, they started on SARS-1. So the same things that you hear about the, the race for making a SARS vaccine right now, how China and Russia and Russia has won and, you know, all those things. India is not far behind. You have the Oxford vaccine, you have this and that. 150, uh, uh, you know, vaccine trials are happening right now of different uh, types of vaccines. The same thing, of course, not to this large extent because uh, SARS-2 has affected us much, so much more, uh, uh, you know, severely than SARS-1 ever did. But the fact is that I, was, I would remember, especially as a practicing scientist, that a lot of groups and many governments paid millions of dollars to initiate vaccine research on SARS-1. So, in fact, a few of my colleagues started on making vaccines, a vaccine against SARS-1. Now, SARS-1 and SARS-2 are very similar, quite similar in their, uh, in their protein structure. You have the spike protein that SARS-2 uses in order to uh, uh, you know, link up with the human receptor and enter the human cell. The same spike protein, of course, with minor differences uh, in, in the amino acids, was used by SARS-1 as well. So people started using those uh, proteins, spike proteins, and protein envelope, so many other proteins of SARS-1, and testing the, uh, them as vaccine candidates. They started to use adenoviruses for that. Now, what happened was they made those vaccines. But by the time uh, uh, the, the, the time came for them to test on, on humans for their efficacy, for clinical trials, the clinical trials began. But clinical trials take years sometimes, or minimum of one year, one and a half years. By the time one or two months into the clinical trials, SARS-1 had disappeared from the, from the planet. Nobody was talking about it. This was, I'm talking about pre-social media. There was no mask. There was nothing. People forgot about SARS-1. So all those vaccines were suddenly in limbo. People forgot about SARS. So obviously they forgot about the vaccine as well. So there is no SARS-1 vaccine. Now the thing is, had there been a SARS-1 vaccine, we could have initially given that SARS-1 vaccine to patients now. And the reason why I say this is, is because a lot of work that is only now coming out is not only do, uh, does our body make antibodies against the SARS-2 virus, there is also something called the T-cell immunity that is also protecting us. A significant amount of that protection is not only because of the antibodies, the IgMs and the IgGs, but also because of T-cell uh, immunity. And a part of that is to do with the memory which is that uh, there is a lot of cross reactivity. So there, there is an element, in fact, people have tested and they have found that the antibodies that were raised against SARS-1 spike protein also bind to SARS-2 spike protein. So of course there was no SARS, there, exist, there doesn't exist a SARS-1 vaccine, but had there existed one, it, if we had it, we could have tried and possibly saved a lot of lives uh, in the initial stages of this pandemic. So that is the biggest lesson that we've learned. And Makaran did touch upon, you know, uh, whether we're going to learn a lesson from a pandemic or not, what will happen once we have a vaccine, we become very complacent, which is absolutely true. Once we have a vaccine, I mean, for example, you have what is called the R0 or the infectivity rate of any virus. Now, in the case of um, uh, COVID, it is 2, 2.5 or 2.25. But the, uh, in, in the case of uh, measles, it is 15. So it is so much more infective, infectious. But nobody worries about it, right? You've never heard the world economy is closing down because of measles. Why? Because we have a vaccine. So it is but natural, but natural, uh, very human, that the moment a vaccine comes along, we would become, I'm not very sure if complacent is the right word, that we, we would we would logically go back to how we were leading our lives because now we have a solution to this problem. But the fact remains that at least we should have that solution. 
because these viruses are going to come back again in 10 years, five years, maybe 15 years, you will have SARS-3. And when SARS-3 comes, I don't want people to say that in the initial stages that it will cause devastation and ruin the world and the health. I don't want people to say that, oh, I'm so sorry, we cannot try. Uh, sorry, is the third, do, uh, do I, uh, I cannot see. Uh, no, no, we're still good. We're okay. still good. And then we'll get logged off. Then you do the third one. Sure, sure. I, I cannot see the screen in front of me. That's what I'm saying. But anyway, I'm, I'm about to finish. Anyway. We, we, we can see you. We can see oh. you and, and hear you right now. Right. I think right. it's a connectivity issue. Right, right, right. So just, just the final point I wanted to make on, on science was that uh, absolutely true, the world may go quote unquote complacent once you have the vaccine, but we must have a vaccine. And we must have, in fact, um, uh, there is one Dr. Bagai who's talked of, we must have a pandemic control center, uh, uh, you know, in order to, for example, like we have the National Disaster uh, Commission, or I forget the, uh, there is an agency that specifically deals with earthquakes and tsunami that was set up after the tsunami. Uh, we must have these pandemic control centers now, uh, you know, set up on a large scale, very well funded, because these viruses, as I said, 10% of our genome is viral DNA. So these we have lived with them. In fact, every uh, seasonal flu, about 8 to 10% of the collection of viruses that infects us are coronaviruses. Of course, uh, some coronaviruses are much more lethal as we've seen with SARS. But on average, 8 to 10% of all common uh, cold viruses are actually corona. So we've, we, we are living with them. We have lived with them. We are going to live. It, it is only a measure of how, if we, if we need to change in order to contain the epidemic or the pandemic, uh, yes, we need to change. So the conclusion is that we must not be like what we were in 2003, where we were really scared of SARS uh, pandemic, but the moment it went away, we stopped all research. And this is exactly what we do, which governments do, because I, I can't, I don't really blame the scientists for this, because uh, a scientist would uh, would work on any topic given to him. To be honest, on many times, the topics are also dictated by where the money is. So, um, uh, you know, a lot of research is done uh, in, in the West on lifestyle diseases. Not much research is done on tuberculosis because, you know, there is no money in it, even after you make the drug. And likewise, we did. Uh, uh, you know, in the field of tuberculosis, because the moment in the 1960s we had antibiotics against tuberculosis, like rifampicin, then isoniazid, ethambutol, all work on tuberculosis stopped. So we be, we actually became complacent as a result when, and we were quite happy about it, ignorant about it, until HIV came. And uh, the single most mortality, the reason for mortality through HIV is actually tuberculosis, because it is an opportunistic disease. People don't die of HIV. They die of tuberculosis, people who have HIV. And that is where you had the resistance scare and you had uh, a WHO calling it, uh, you know, a, a real global problem and issue. And then people started working on tuberculosis again. And now after 20 years of research, 25 years, we have one drug that has entered the market, Bedeloquine. And now people have become so aware that they don't want to give Bedeloquine in isolation. They say that no, because that is one reason why bugs gain resistance if you give just one drug. So now Bedeloquine is to be given, is really tightly regulated by, uh, by, the, by the Indian government. So much so that uh, a doctor, uh, Dr. Udwadia, who wanted to give Bedeloquine to his patient, uh, who had totally drug resistant tuberculosis, had to, her parents had to approach the high court for permission. And the high court gave permission so that Bedeloquine could be given. So um, uh, it, it is a human trait to become complacent, but more worrying is when governments become complacent and they stop all research just because the, the problem doesn't exist anymore. I think that is one change that we must see uh, in the coming years, that especially third world countries, developing countries like India, they have to change this. They have to look at least 30 to 40 to 50 years ahead. So in these four topics, I, I would stop now just to tell you that in the four topics that I've uh, dealt with, the first one, which was trade, economy, decoupling with China, I'm talking of 20 to 30 years looking into the future. In the education, the university field, uh, uh, leapfrogging technology, I'm talking of five to 10 years looking ahead. In arts and cinema, 
I don't have a solution to that. So I think we're going to revert to uh, how we were before the pandemic. And in science, I'm looking at least five to 10 years ahead, how to plan, if not, uh, uh, you know, make institutes, but at least keep reserves ready, keep the vaccines there for the present pandemic so that when this goes away, as it will go away in two or three months, and in five years down the line, you have SARS-3, we don't, we don't have to say or lament that, oh my God, we can't try a vaccine that we had on SARS-2 or SARS-1, because sh sure as uh, day, they would be using, these viruses would be using the same uh, methods to enter um, uh, human cells. So I, I would finish there. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening to these four issues that I wanted to talk about, whether we should change or we shouldn't change post COVID. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. That was riveting as usual. And uh, I wish you were here with us. We would have offered you filter coffee and Mysore Park. <laughs> <laughs> the latter is a bit difficult to get here because the more common sweets here are basin and so forth, right? Uh, and pinny and so forth. But we, we would have made a special effort in your case. And not while you were talking, chola bhaturas. sorry, not steamed chola bhaturas. Well, that too, but you know, that's that's savory, that's namkeen, and not. Uh, <laughs> I think filter coffee in Mysore Park, no substitute for that. Absolutely. Uh, for Uncle Ranga. And while you were speaking, people were messaging me and, uh, you know, on Twitter and else how, and they were saying, we like him better with his beard. So here's, here's, the, feed <laughs> here's the feedback for you. But uh, before I throw it open, I just uh, wanted to say that was uh, wonderful. And I'm sure all our fellows will agree how wide ranging your talk was, you know, covering four prominent areas of human endeavor. And again, cross-hatching, you know, the humanities and the sciences, as very few people can do uh, on either side of the spectrum. So I think uh, that that's, uh, that's a special quality that you bring to your work, because I don't think science is, is uh, to be pursued in ivory towers and in labs alone, but the, you know, reaching out to the so-called masses, because it's so much a part of our lives that we can't afford to be ignorant. And as you said, we know so little about the 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 virome, you know, the human virome, the microbiome. We we think we know a little more. There's yeah, maybe yeah. 40 trillion bacteria which are a part of the human microbiome, but apparently viruses outnumber bacteria 10 to 1. Yeah. So that's 400 trillion, and uh, as as you said, we don't know where the next one's going to come from. But, uh, you know, one of the things while you were talking, I was also reflecting on Snowden's book, and, and he mentioned that uh, one of the effects of a pandemic, you know, is terror. It terrorizes the populace and it makes people superstitious they look for scapegoats. Uh, they look for, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's like a witch hunt. They look a little bit happened with the tab tabli tabligis also. They think it's also God's wrath, you know. So it really pulverizes, you know, whatever rational, uh, you know, uh, social and uh, other arrangements we've had. And, you know, we almost retreat into an atavistic relationship, you know, with, with this powerful and vengeful kind of God in the heavens who's punishing us for our sins. But luckily, in a sense, with, uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2, because the case fatality ratio is so low, I mean, probably going to be coming down to 1%, whereas bubonic plague was as high as 50%. And Ebola was also very high, as you said. Smallpox could go as high as 70%, depending on the kind of pox you got. There's also, as you rightly said, a certain kind of uh, blasé, I would say COVID-19 fatigue, you know, people couldn't care less. And I was just talking to some, some people in Bangalore who are working with Dr. Devi Shetty, and they said, you know, he said one of the fascinating things about this virus is we hardly know anything about it. That uh, why does it kill that roughly 1% of the people it kills across age and other spectrums? And we talk about comorbidity, we talk about other things, but actually we don't know. Because a lot of people, even 100-year-old people, are recovering. Yes. And then a, a certain bunch of people are suddenly dying. And... Uh, there are some intangible factors about it, you know, including the will to live, you know. 
And I still remember a, a, a doctor that came on CNN, I forgot his name now, who was telling us his experience, you know, and since he was a doctor, he was monitoring himself, monitoring the oxygen level, and he found that it's coming below like 98% and he immediately called up his colleagues uh, and they, they, they took him to the hospital. And what, what I realized when I heard him was that, you know, you sometimes pass, uh, pass into a kind of daze because your oxygen levels reduce and then, uh, you know, your organs start failing before you know it. So if you're isolated, if you're old, if you don't have caretakers, uh, people monitoring your oxygen, then you're more likely you know, to succumb. And then he said something. He said the malaise was so high that he didn't feel like even moving. He just was, you know, and that will to live, you know, that eros, that will to live. Uh, that, and so uh, one of the things I really liked about what you said, uh, mix, mate, and make the... I think that was fantastic. Directive evolution, as you said, leapfrogging through technology when it came to education. But obviously, mix, mat. Um, uh, made, make the cut contradicts on, you know, uh, trying to boycott the authoritarian regimes, not trading with them because they give you unfavorable terms. So there are these challenges for the world. And, you know, UN and other resources, international institutions have failed to exert pressure and to act in a concerted fashion against regimes. So we're still in a very messy world. Yeah. Where, uh, I don't think humanity has the uh, you know, uh, wisdom to act together, even to save itself at this crisis, you know. So you have Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam on the one hand, on the other hand, you know, you have a kind of winner-takes-all uh, attitude, uh, you know. So anyhow, I'll leave it at that, and let's, let's invite questions from our fellows. Uh, so uh, let me see if I've got any already. Uh, well, none so far. You seem to have dazzled everybody. Uh, so, um, if anyone has anything to ask, I think I'm going to call on uh, uh, Professor Raju because, you know, we can always rely on him to uh, both start a conversation and end it if required. So, uh, Professor Raju, if you can hear me, go ahead and ask, 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 or uh, ask a question or offer a comment if you can hear me. I think I don't have any questions. Uh, so, yeah, sorry. Yes, one thing, when we have so much of good advice, how come we are performing so badly? How come we are the worst performers in the world? Sorry, could you repeat that? Worst performance in... in we are uh, the worst performers so far as COVID is concerned in the world. Let's really come out on top. How did we manage to do that? With so many people doing so much good advice. Okay, actually, uh, Professor Raju, first of all, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure uh, to see you again. I think I've, I met you uh, in during Jaipur dialogues, I think, two two years ago. So uh, thanks very much. Uh, it's a very interesting question that you ask, and the answer to that is, uh, I'm afraid, no, that's not correct. We are, in fact, one of the, if, if at all, best can be used under these circumstances. We are one of the best performers. And the reason for that is that since, uh, uh, you know, this whole thing started, people have been at RT-PCR testing. So when you talk of that, we have, uh, you know, 2 million cases, 3 million cases, the U.S. has 6 million cases. These are all RT-PCR tests. That is that they are detecting the, the live virus or the viral RNA in high view. That means you, uh, so it's an expensive test. You you give your DNA sample or sorry, your, your swab, throat swab or something and check for the presence of RNA. So these are all cases that are live viruses. But the fact is that uh, they do not include or they cannot include the people who already had COVID, but they got recovered and they do not have the live viruses, but they have the antibody. And what people have done throughout the world when they have actually investigated this, they have found, for example, in New York, 15% or 17% of the population had COVID, whereas only 1% showed up using these tests. Likewise, in India, we have 2.5 million cases, but there are about 23% to 24% Indians 
So 24% or quarter of our own population is COVID positive, according to serological, estimated according to serological tests. Now, when we talk about doing bad or worse, so it cannot be using this as a denominator because this is erroneous. What denominator we should use is the number of deaths per million population because that is what is the right metric. The mortality, not even the mortality rate, which people are uh, calculating because they are using, again, the uh, RT-PCR test as the denominator. So just very briefly, mortality rate is the number of deaths divided by the number of cases. And so even though the number of deaths does not change because, uh, you know, someone who's died of COVID is registered as having died of COVID, but the denominator, which is the number of cases, changes. So, for example, if you were to do RT-PCR tests, you would find that 2 million cases. So, the deaths, number of deaths is 60,000 divided by 2 million. It comes to about 1.5 to 2 percent is CFR. But, of course, that denominator, if you were to look at the antibody test done, it's 300, 400 million. So, what that, what that does immediately is, if your deaths per million population comes to ours is about 25. 24 deaths per million population. In America, it is 600. In Belgium, it is 800 per million population. So we are ranked at least 100 nations, below 100 nations, according to this. So uh, we are not doing that bad. And one of the reasons that has been given uh, is that we are all BCG vaccinated by, uh, in fact, uh, my colleague and Professor Govardhan Das, who is uh, uh, Professor Makarant Paranjpe would know, uh, in uh, Special Center of Molecular Medicine in JNU. So his hypothesis when this whole thing started was that because we are BCG vaccinated, he's an immunologist, so he, he gave multiple reasons that BCG not only helps children, uh, uh, you know, help helps prevent children, it also helps prevent a lot of uh, respiratory, uh, uh, respiratory uh, infections as well as viral infections uh, through immunological reasons. And that has actually now come to be true. In many cases, there are clinical trials that are going on. In fact, just today on his Twitter timeline, he has published a cell paper. He has reported the publication of a cell paper where a clinical trial using BCG vaccination shows that it is very effective uh, in preventing infections, viral infections in elderly. So, uh, you know, the kind of strain of BCG that Indians are vaccinated by the, our universal vaccination, BCG vaccination policy, the fact that our death rate is only 25 or 30 per million, whereas America, UK is 600, 700, Belgium 800 per million. I, I don't think we are doing that bad. That is what my answer would be. Exactly. Also, there is another side to this. It's about, uh, you know, public health uh, and uh, access to treatment. Uh, which might have prevented some deaths yes. where we may not be doing that well. And also, uh, you know, in the manner in which uh, we are observing distancing and other such things, there we might have performed better. But, uh, 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 you know, being a democracy, uh, it's very hard. Uh, you know, this is another collateral question. You yeah. mentioned China quite a bit in your uh, initial remarks that it, it seems that authoritarian societies and highly disciplined societies like Japan and Korea uh, handle these situations better than somewhat chaotic and unregulated societies, you know? Yes, yes. Uh, so capacity building, that's where, uh, and I think there we did very well when we responded in early days to the Prime's appeal because he's such a good communicator, you know? But, uh, I think the, the, the BCG angle, the immunity that we have possibly because we're already exposed to so many viruses, exactly. uh, all, all of these factors, and our recovery rates are very high, I'm told. Infections are spreading. Uh, we can see that now it's, I think, over 3 million now, 3.6 million. But death rates are low, recovery rates are fairly robust. And uh, I suspect a lot of people who are, are very poor people, you know, who don't have... Forget about oxygen. They don't even have clean water, proper nutrition. And uh, and therefore, uh, they are more susceptible. Like, suppose you have a kidney infection or a liver infection, and then you get COVID. Yeah. Regardless yeah. of your age, it's much more likely that if you don't get oxygen and other ventilator support, you're going to go. So I think our deaths, we haven't done that kind of social analysis as to 
you know, who's most affected in India. Whereas abroad, we know it's been elderly people in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. Yes. Uh, who've yeah. been really, you know, who, who as it were, uh, you know, have succumbed to COVID-19. Now in India, we don't Another know. Another important, if, if I may interrupt, uh, Makaran, because please, I just want please, to add the point. Because uh, what, what you say is absolutely true. But it also can go the other way. For example, people who are very poor, they're in, in many ways, uh, they are not affected by the so-called comorbidity as far as COVID is concerned. Because they, you know, they don't, they don't have these lifestyle diseases that the very rich have. And people have found that, for example, in in, in areas, in, especially in Mumbai, where they have incredible, I mean, the highest population density in the world, for example, Dhabi, about 57 to 60 percent of the slum Mumbai slum population is COVID positive. You know, so uh, millions are COVID positive. They are, many are asymptomatic, but many were symptomatic. They, they got cured. So this is something that I don't know. We have naturally been, and you talked about, uh, we've been exposed to so many viruses. It is true. Plus, as Professor Das also says, we have a very low, what is called the hygiene index. So uh, this is, India is one of, has one of the lowest hygiene indexes. So that has also saved us because that has exposed us to a lot of uh, viruses that may have their proteins that are very similar to the COVID virus. So, you know, you, you have T cell memory response going back years so antibodies may last for months or sometimes very rarely in for year but t cell response t cell activation and t cell killing uh, you know will last for years on it so you know we kind of see it i i think so i think as you said i think it's a bit of a double-edged sword because earlier it was seen as a first world disease you know almost you know the curse of capitalism yeah. Now we see that it's it's non-discriminatory. It doesn't care for your religion, your ideology, your class, etc. More and more, just like plague, you know. Yeah. Uh, in fact, yeah. the, as I was reading this book, the, the the worst thing about plague, though, was it killed off the able-bodied in a in a section of the populace, uh, and so it left lots of widows and children, and it devastated society almost like AIDS, where an entire generation is wiped out, you know, whereas COVID is not quite like that. Uh, and so it seems, you know, comparatively a little more benign. But here we have a few more questions. Uh, Dr. Chehel, no, Dr. Anjali Duhan says, I come from Haryana, a state considered rich and prospering. However, there are numerous villages which are completely debt ridden, not from the government banks, but with loans from exploiting middlemen. Also, you only mentioned that there are problems in the agriculture center. No, he said, I think Dr. Ranganathan said the agricultural sector is flourishing. So flourishing. I think you misquoted him. Anyway, the question is, what is your view of the one solution which uh, would be more beneficial to the sector and why? So she's asking, uh, like, what is it that we can do? You talked about farmer suicide, certainly. And you also mentioned insurance will prevent suicides or reduce suicides. But she still wants to know uh, what else can we do? And then there's a uh, follow-up question. Maybe you can take both of them from her at the same time. If all the businesses are privatized, uh, then there are chances that we may lose our businesses to foreign companies. What is your opinion? Okay. As, as far as the first, uh, first question is concerned, I'm afraid I'm, I'm, um, I'm on the side of uh, India actually not spending that much, not investing that much in agriculture. My, my thing is that we need flexibility in our economy. We simply cannot afford, I mean, we've been very, very lucky, quote unquote, uh, lucky is in quotes, that the agricultural sector has grown by 3% in the last six months. But let us say, if what if it wasn't COVID? Uh, uh, you know, what if it was a famine, devastating famine or floods? you know, then of course that affects the agricultural sector. So it would have, the growth would have dipped. So we've been quite lucky in that sense. So, we, you know, when, when we have a huge sector, which is at the mercy of these elements, you know, that cannot be controlled by humans to a very large extent, uh, uh, you know, that does not augur well for any economy, especially one an aspiring developed world economy. And you certainly cannot have 44% of your workforce, which is uh, 475 million people, 
44% involved in something that is at the mercy of these elements. So we have to change, we have to be flexible. And of course, you know, the, the proof is always there. There is no world economy, prosperous first world, or even middle income economy that has 44% of its labor force in, uh, involved in agriculture. And the returns are only 12% of the GDP. So, you know, I, I wouldn't mind if so many people were involved in agriculture and we were, it was contributing 50% to our GDP. But the fact is that it isn't. And we are using the same agricultural practices. We are still growing sugar cane. And I gave you the example of, you know, how much water it, it, it requires and, you know, how it is again at the mercy of world sugar prices. So all these things factored in, I think we'll be much better off training our farmers to actually pick up something else. So you know, multi-sectorial approach includes agriculture is the way to go. Uh, you know, there is a uh, an argument, a counter argument that given our, our lack of capacity to generate employment, even work, what what Indian farming does is it just keeps large sections of the populace True. True. occupied, is it, not yeah. fully employed, but occupied and fed. Yeah. And the reason that it contributes only 12% is because farm prices are artificially suppressed yeah. so that people don't starve. So. The government regulates farm prices. There's no free market mechanism. Yeah. And so a lot of farmers complain that, look, you suppress the prices, you're manipulating the whole sector, you don't allow agribusiness, land holdings keep re reducing. So, you know, large scale reform and rethinking is absolutely necessary. But they've done said, I think in this uh, two months ago, I think this government has actually now brought in, they have made just the changes that you were just now suggesting. So I think exactly. it. This, this is going to going to be very good for this sector. Uh, and then, as you said, you know, to grow soybean, to grow millets, to stop stop growing these cash crops which are bleaching the earth and destroying the fertility of the soil and so forth. And uh, you know that brings us to another question, which is, you know, it's very controversial, of course, in India. But I'm not going to mention any products, but. Everybody talks about Ayurvedic immunity boosters, and uh, somewhere, somewhere there is, there is, uh, I think, uh, something going on here which we haven't fully articulated. Which is that, obviously, we cannot uh, renounce the methodology of modern science with its triple-blind trials, but somewhere there seems to be some merit in, uh, you know, uh, in in building in building a healthy lifestyle. Uh, which uh, even if one doesn't believe in the humor, humorial theory of doshas and all that, somehow, you know, balancing and the right diet, you know, lowering stress, yoga, breathing, somehow these uh, coupled with, uh, you know, herbs or whatever that seems to be good for us, sourced locally, etc. There seems to be a lifestyle component to trying to live a healthier life, which modern society somehow discourages. You know, yes. I have a friend, he's into plant diets, okay? So oh, it's a fad and he, he claims his diabetes has really been reduced. But what he's really trying to say, and he's a very intelligent man, he owns a couple of hospitals, by the way, and he told me, he said that, look, I can't say it in public because I'll go out of business, that his basic point is that there's a lot of investment by huge uh, corporations, you know, uh, liquor companies, uh, you know, tobacco companies, all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, agents to keep people unhealthy, tempting them uh, to adopt lifestyles, to, to do things which are eventually going to kill them, eat wrong, eat fatty food, whatever. And this is constantly being promoted as opposed to, yeah. to a simpler, healthier life, you know, where there's less consumption uh, and there's a balance with nature. So do you have anything to say about whether we can combine these, uh, you know, traditional medical practices uh, for a healthy life with uh, cutting edge, you know, modern, as you said, uh, uh, you know, research so that vaccinations and, and uh, vaccines rather uh, can come out fast and, and hum humanity, you know, can be protected. Is there a way to combine these? This is my question. Absolutely. And I think you've hit the lane on the head because... This is what India was really good at, Makaran, in the 50s and 60s. We were the leaders in the world in the domain of natural products. And I don't know what happened. We completely dropped it like a hot potato. And, you know, we shouldn't have. To give you one example, 
you know, artemisinin, which is now the, the preferred anti-malarial drug because every, you know, uh, the, the plasmodium parasite is resistant to chloroquine, was discovered in China and is product of a plant. And uh, the Chinese woman who discovered it got the Nobel Prize, I think, three or four years ago. And, uh, of course, uh, she published it in a, in a journal with an impact factor of 0.9. So that is also that is also a very good lesson, humbling lesson to all us uh, academy, uh, you know, uh, academics that something that was published with an impact factor of 0.9 won the Nobel Prize. Nobel but Prize. the fact is that there were millions of people, millions of Chinese who were actually consuming those leaves, and uh, they were, uh, you know, able to uh, cure malaria. The same goes with the bark, bark of the tree that actually. Uh, from where chloroquine was isolated. So, you know, and likewise, there are so many instances of herbs in Ayurveda. By the way, I'm a great believer in Ayurveda and a great advocate of Ayurveda. But this fact, the important fact that you talked of that we have to combine, we have to change, you know, our own thought processes to combine modern scientific techniques with the ancient wisdom. And I'll just give you one example how we, we're not doing that and how even 100, 150 years ago, people had the vision to do it. So you could either to cure malaria, you could actually grind the bark of this tree and, you know, get quinine out in some amount and give it. Or what Henry Welcome did, who became a billionaire, is to actually make a pill out of it. So chloroquine was marketed as a pill, how he became a billionaire, you know. Just a simple idea of isolating the active ingredient from the bark and selling it as anti-malaria. Now we have this uh, Sri Lakshmi Kutti, Srimati Lakshmi Kutti, she got the Padma Shri three years ago. She has a repository of 500 medicinal herbs. You know, we should in India should have 100 institutes of natural products whose only job should be exactly this. That is to find out, call them Lakshmi Kutti institutes, you know, take one herb, isolate the active ingredient and then work on it, market it. And I'm not, I'm not after money, but you know, money doesn't hurt. If for example, India becomes a trillion dollar economy by selling two wonder drugs, I mean, is it going to hurt us? It's not. So, you know, we have to think along those lines. This vaccine is one prime example. You know, somebody who's going to sell this anti-COVID vaccine, he'll probably earn a trillion dollars, especially because you need boosters and you know, you need to give it again and again and again. Now, is, is it a crime to earn that money, you know, from, uh, having developed that vaccine, so India has to think along those lines, not only uh, find one part of the population, if it wants to just consume those herbs and get cured, that's all right by me. But there is another aspect that we, we refuse to explore and we must go along those lines, that is isolate the active molecule, make each one of them a billion dollar, trillion dollar selling drugs. Great. That actually brings us to the second question, or rather the next question from Dr. Chahel. And he's asking exactly about uh, how soon can the vi vaccine come in India and where will it come from? And then he says, uh, can we scale it up so that 130 crores of the population will have access to it? Yeah, so India is the world's largest producer of vaccines. You know, uh, there is this uh, serum institute in Pune and Punawalas are uh, involved in this. Um, and they are now... Uh, now they are doing clinical trials or involved in clinical trials of at least two vaccines. One of them is the Oxford vaccine. Oxford vaccine. And to assure the population uh, that, look, everything is fine. And that is the reason why, you know, we gave it to his daughter. But the fact is that clinical trials to take minimum of one to two years. 
So if a vaccine comes out before that, it can either be like what Russia is doing, or um, uh, uh, you know the 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 you know it has been expedited to insane levels. And I'm not I'm not very sure if all countries would agree to that. That said, it will not take one or two years. It will take I would say a, a proper clinical trial vaccine that comes out of a proper clinical trial a year. So we're looking at maybe next summer. Exactly. And it seems that uh, they've already skipped the animal trials. You see, they've gone straight to human trials. And also, uh, in terms of the science, maybe you can also explain the different models or the different types of vaccine that they're working on, you know, uh, so, because they're not all identical. There are different I, kinds. I, you know? Absolutely. There, there are a lot. There are very different types. There is one RNA vaccine that is basically just the RNA material, genetic material. It is, I think, Moderna, Moderna vaccine. That is also, I think, phase two clinical trials. Uh, uh, the biggest hope is of from the Oxford vaccine that has the the spike protein that I was talking about. So that the the genes for the has been put in an adenovirus, which is again a virus that infects in that case a chimpanzee. So that adenovirus is going to infect the humans, and, and it is going to insert this this D, the DNA of the spike protein uh, of the coronavirus. And as that replicates, you could have millions of copies of this spike protein, and your own immune system would recognize that, make antibodies against it, and that is how the vaccine would come. The third one is the Chinese vaccine. I forget what the name of that is. Um, it has. Um, Ask Pakistan to conduct the clinical trials for the Chinese vaccine. It is um, it is inactivated version of the coronavirus. So, like in many cases, what earlier when we did not have the molecular biology techniques, like putting it in genetically modified adenovirus or taking RNA out of it, what people would do is would simply uh, heat inactivate the virus. So you would have a dead virus, but of course the dead virus would not be able to replicate, but it would still have the proteins and those proteins our body would recognize as pathogens and make antibodies against so this chinese vaccine is not heat inactivated but it is inactivated by some alcohol uh, butanol or something like that some some ingredient that inactivates the virus that it cannot reproduce the fourth and the most effective and the easiest the safest vaccine is again i, I think bharat biotech is also working on that in some indian organization is you simply take part of this um, vaccine uh, i'm sorry part of the virus like the spike protein and you you make tons and tons of it and you inject just this protein so you're not injecting the dna you're not injecting the virus you're not injecting the inactivated or heat killed virus you simply injecting what is a part of this virus which is the the spike protein and your body would recognize it and would make antibodies against it so that next time you are infected by the real virus that is expressing that protein, these same antibodies will recognize that virus and kill, which is the case with hepatitis B vaccine. So it is it it has the envelope protein of the hepatitis virus, and the moment the real virus comes along, your antibodies recognize that uh, because they have they already been made uh, uh, with the happy protein that was there earlier. Uh, one other question that comes up is about this, as you said, the spike protein, which is what gives corona its name. But there are several kinds of, uh, I think, coronaviruses. And uh, many of us may have already had one or the other, uh, you know, like we've had the flu, possibly. So is there a cross, uh, is there a cross immunity from one to the other? Or are we fated like the flu to 500 varieties and mutations, and then you get one, but it doesn't help you against the other. Though the lock and key mechanism seems similar, uh, they all operate with that spike protein. But yet, you got one, but there's no cellular memory. Maybe there is a cellular me memory, but it's, it's unable to tackle this variety. That's a great question. In fact, which is what the science uh, in the last couple of months is telling us, and which is what is the T cell immunity that there is a tremendous amount of cross reactivity and has developed because we humans have always encountered these coronaviruses. Not only that, many, many uh, zootic, uh, coronaviruses that have come up from bats and all that. So I think there's a cell paper um, maybe a month ago 
that they tested the blood of patients before the corona pandemic happened and they tested it with the antibodies against the proteins of the present coronavirus and they found hmm. that that can only mean that your body already knew or had an imprint of the present corona coronavirus proteins because it was earlier it with a, a different coronavirus so and that is why makar and i said that you know this is the year we face that in two or three months when this pandemic goes away and people forget about it all this research billions of dollars which people are spending government spending right now that they also had started spending in 2003 against SARS-1. I hope they do not just stop the research. Because if they were five years down the line, we should be able to have not only a vaccine, but also a drug against, see, uh, uh, this um, HCQ that people talk about and chloroquine being effective against SARS. You won't believe it, but uh, this was first suggested by an Italian scientist, Italian doctor in 2009 because he tested it against SARS-1 but he said i could not complete the research because there was the virus was gone there was no money in it. you know so much of research and it it is it is back breaking because uh, there is there was another virus called the mers virus middle eastern respiratory yeah. yeah from camel is far more deadly just killed correct. almost everybody you got it yeah and that came in 2015 lot of research people started you know doing research on it but that went away quicker than even sars 1 so Correct. all that research stopped again and that, that is a tragedy and that is where what you said you know we should not be complacent but more than humans being complacent uh, Govern- i think governments yeah exactly Because, believe it or not if tomorrow narendra modi says i am uh, uh, you know allocating half a billion dollars on this no no matter how much complacent i am i will start working on corona <laughs> because there is money you know you will you will have people working on it money drives research and look at look at ebola i All mean right. it's still it's still there but yet we've forgotten about it because it seems to infect very few people mostly yes. in africa yes. so it's simply not on the radar but uh, last question and then we'll let you go i was very fascinated about uh, Uh, you know your your uh, ideas about the future of education and uh, you know how much we've invested in physical infrastructure in universities you know like campuses buildings uh, of course labs are still going to be required but you you've said that almost you know this type of university is obsolete so we have universities in the clouds as it were literally and th- that whole pecking order business the way we we certify knowledge validate it seek it i think i think we should be moving towards uh, you know learning cultures learning environment so that uh, uh, human beings can continually update their skills and equip themselves and the entire model of a university where you go say at the age of 18 or 19 i mean all of this needs to change because maybe at 18 and 19 you want to do something else and yes. you know the classroom confinement you know and at the same time the loss of the campus culture because we grew through our peers you know uh, which uh, you're going to miss in a virtual space i mean uh, being together in a college and it's not the classroom that you encounter the most interesting minds in you just yeah. encounter them outside in you know whatever at, uh, uh, at rotas's dhaba or wherever you are yeah. uh, at so forth so i mean there there's so much thinking that needs to be done so much opportunity and yet such a big challenge because actually our institutions are failing all around us you know we are just not able to uh, you know nurture an environment of excellence our best institutions are often especially in the humanities and social studies are given over to a very destructive and disabling kind of politics as we know and this is an opportunity to break free from that kind of campus culture on the one hand of gherals and agitations and etc etc and yet there's also a great loss because when we don't uh, you know congregate in that fashion we don't learn from each other and, uh, you can sit at home and listen to the finest lectures in science even if you're in humanities fine or whoever you have and yet it's not going to be the same as being in a space like a classroom which is like a pressure chamber 
and can yeah. catalyze creativity you know so what are your thoughts on that yeah so i i think um, again that's that's a very important question and um, there is no direct answer to that uh, except i'm not if if there is if if uh, in fact that's just given me an idea of having a webinar dharna so you know you have, <laughs> i don't know whether that's possible makaran if somebody if 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 one of the uh, political uh, would hack into this webinar right now and start conducting a dharna but uh, you know on uh, that was on a lighter note uh, i think what you say is absolutely true that a university has to be a place for interaction away from the classroom as well and of course you online that is simply impossible but um education as we have seen it you know educating students and uh, pupils and school children in classrooms i think that has to undergo a monumental change and i think if that happens uh, one of the uh, you know you would remember while we were growing up makaran uh, the fact that he is a jack of all trades master or none was actually used as a pejorative you know was, was used to condemn someone i think the time has come for us to celebrate this you know celebrate the fact that one is a jack of all trades and master of none and how does one become that through uh, easiest of means is not by is actually through online you know if if you are exposed to let us say 10 different uh, uh, 10 different sub brilliant uh, online classroom lecturing of arts or sciences of humanities or music drama that is impossible for you to do physically even if you go to one university it is you know even uh, maybe 6 months you can't do it even in one day so i think things of that sort can be uh, so th- there has to be a complement i completely take your point that the whole growing up thing of uh, imbibing education and wisdom is half maybe more than half to do with human interactions away from the classroom and that of course can i don't know if some uh, you know genius would to replicate that maybe online you know webinars were nobody thought of these webinars 20 years ago you know nobody nobody thought of online education 30 years ago so i don't know where the world is going to be honest but there has to be a mix of these two yeah i think it's going to be a great disruptor technology in both a positive and negative way as you said maybe alongside campus culture you can also have kind of off campus learning and uh, sharing through webinars and about getting a webinar hijacked and being turned into a protest we've already had it here but oh, the last thing here, oh my but you can just log out you know and to make it a, a a manner to extract something is a little more difficult you know yes, without yes. a physical demonstration but uh, <laughs> as as my i just want to give you our very hearty and sincere vote of thanks uh, anand so you, know, you, talk, you you talked about uh, you know jack of all trades i must uh, you know confess uh, that uh, uh, you know you've got the hack of turning <laughs> jack of all trades into a master of all trades that's what you are you're, you're not just jack, jack of all trades i can attest to your uh, you know multi valence and your multitudinous gifts and talents and honestly as as someone who's a little bit older than you i wish you well i i Thank want you. your genius to flourish and uh, i think everybody who comes in contact with uh, with uh, uh, you know ranga uncle is left <laughs> just a little bit more richer uh, provoked into thinking more clearly sharply uh, with facts with statistics uh, and and becomes little more sane little more civilized uh, you know little more uh, should i say cherry of fake news you know of hypocrisy double standards and i think your presence in the public sphere uh is is uh, i mean i think is really a gift to the nation so with those words my good wishes to you anand hope to see you in person soon absolutely thank you once again thank, thank you, you for so much. such a pleasure and honor thank you so much to you and your colleagues thank you makaran bye 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 thank you